So now, without further ado, I'm pleased to present Dr. Saffron. Hi, Eva. Can you hear me well? Loud and clear. Great. Um, I'd like to speak tonight about the use of special domain OCT in an anterior surgery practice. Um, I'm a solo uh, anterior segment surgeon. I see a broad range of pathology in my practice. I'm cornea trained. I do mostly cataract surgery, glaucoma, cornea transplant, defects, you know, a broad range of anterior segment stuff. And I do uh, examine my own patients. I don't have an optometrist. Uh, so um, I, I, it is important for me to be as efficient as possible. Um, when spectral domain OCT first came out, I said, well, you know, it's very nice, but I'm not a retina specialist, so I really need this. Um, and as the uh, uh, images got better and better with spectral domain OCT, um, we put together a buying group uh, at the ASCRF two years ago, and about a dozen of us got together in the uh, Cerebral Technology, and um, I, I was the hand that and we decided to all purchase uh, spectralis for our practice. And um, I was hoping it would be beneficial for my practice, but I don't think I really could have anticipated uh, how important this has become in my practice uh, for so many reasons, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Um, how has this affected my practice? Well, I can see things clearly that were not even in the differential diagnosis prior to this, things that I did not even know existed, like with no macular holes, subretinal fluid, vitreous macular traction, things that are just, they're just OCT diagnosis. Uh, because of this uh, technology, I can make better surgical choices for my patients, especially in regards to premium IOL. Um, I, I got an IOL master in 2000 and started uh, doing array implants after that, and I felt that without the IOL master, I would not be able to do multifocal lenses. Well, um, you know, uh, we all, I think, have uh, realized how important that technology is. Now in my practice, I feel like I would not be able to do multifocal lenses without um, knowing what's going on at the level of the macula. So on every pre-med lens candidate, we get an OCT and the topography of the cornea. Um, th this is really a huge time saver because we are really going down the wrong diagnostic or surgical path because you know what's going on. And honestly, I, I, I can tell you I'm learning new things every day because of this technology. It, it really has made me a better physician having this in my office. So it's taught me how to look at the macula because I can see things I couldn't see before because I have clinical correlation of the, what I see on the spectralis. Um, what I use it for in my office is uh, mainly pre-op the macula testing, cataract surgery, and surgery I do, uh, helping to determine who should or shouldn't get a premium in the lens implant, post-op the macula assessment, assessing unexplained visual loss, following patients with known macular disease, Discovering unknown pathology, the things you can't see, like the metal hole, vitreous macular traction, subretinal fluid, and vitreous papillary traction, assessing response to treatment, and glaucoma optic neuropathy evaluation. I'm going to talk about all of these things in my talk tonight. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the spectralis itself because I'm very excited about this technology. I, I, I give these talks because I feel very strongly about this uh, technology and what it can do for. Uh, my practice and anybody else's practice who gets, who, who gets things to offend. First of all, the reason we chose spectralis as a group is because it actually is the fastest spectral domain OCT uh, of the major uh, machines on the market. Um, it's uh, does 30,000 eight scans per second. And the main thing about this machine is the only OCT active eye tracking. Uh, eye tracking uh, allows you to scan the same place every time and it allows you to over-scan the same place every time about up to 100 times. So it gives far res greater resolution and detail, and it can see what other machines can't. Um, you know you're going to the same area over and over, and it eliminates losing artifacts. Uh, when you look at the same area over and over, you can generate reliable difference maps over time. And also the SLO camera, the scanning laser ophthalmoscopy camera, gives excellent image of the retina the reference to OCT to, unlike some of the other machines that have infrared cameras which really aren't that good. Um, well, you know, the old OCT that's, you know, the uh, time domain, um, there's a lot of hidden artifacts because the, um, the things scan so slowly that there's movement um, while you're scanning. So it's a bit like if you're drawing a straight line uh, in a moving car that's bouncing up and down, 
The line on the paper is going to end up jagged even if you draw a straight line because the paper's moving. If the patient's moving, you scan a straight line. If the eye's moving, you're going to get images that are reconstructed as straight lines, but they're not straight lines. You put together different pieces of retina. So the algorithms reconstruct the data, but you're not reconstructing what's really there. You're sort of creating a mishmash of different areas of the retina that are put together. The spectralis has a dual beam tracker. So one, in it, one, one beam tracks the eye, the other uh, scans while one beam tracks. And uh, what, what that does is we to overscan up to 20 times the same area over and over. Now, Zeiss will say, well, you know, our machine's faster because it can only do one scan. It can't overscan. If you scan one scan with spectralis, it's actually faster than the other uh, machines on the market. But if you put it to do 100 overscans and some eight images, it's going to take a little bit longer because it's doing a lot more. You don't have to do that, but the technology is there. The reason this is important technology is because with those 100 scans, you can summate the up to 100 average scans and eliminate the noise, increase imaging detail. Okay? And that's really what gives you uh, these very high quality images I'm going to show you. With this technology, you also can go back to the same area over and over, which is particularly important when you're looking at a specific area, specific area of the retina or the optic nerve. You know what you're looking at is the exact same area over and over and over again. So while the software may change over time, the hardware is what you're going to be stuck with. This is the only machine that has this technology. Now, the single beam system on the left, you have one beam scanning the retina. If the eye moves, that's it. So with spectralis, if the patient moves, the scan moves with it. So it, it tracks just like a tracker for a, you know, a, a laser. It doesn't explain it when you do LASIK. Um, so if you're doing, let's say, a nerve fiber layer scan, uh, which is a circle scan around the optic nerve, if the patient moves with well, any cycle portion, it follows that. Um, the way the image noise, the noise reduction technology works is there are 100, up to 100 image takes, 100 images taken at the same location. And what it does is it identifies noise as anything that's not common to all the images, throws it out. If it's not common, it throws it out. And if it is common, it keeps it. And it filters all the junk away and summates the images to give you these wonderful, creamy, gorgeous, noise-free pictures that look like histology. Now, because we have a body group, I actually have a little RPE detachment right here in my retina, sort of a form through the central serous retinopathy. And this is my uh, image of my right eye on a spectralis. Here you can see a little RPE detachment. which looks like a kidney beam. And here's the very nice clinical correlation of that. You can see where it is in the retina. Everything's laid out very nicely for you. Here's the same um, image of my eye on the same day. This is done with an OptiView system. And you can see that the infrared camera really doesn't give you much to look at. Uh, you don't know what you really look like looking underwater. You don't know really what you're looking at. And the OCT image, while it's pretty good, it's not, you know, it's not on this level. And here's uh, the same day uh, with the Cirrus. Um, you can see there's the RPE detachment. And, you know, it's, it's, I think it's pretty good, but I don't think it's as good as this. This is spectralis. And this is with only 12 over scans. We could go up to 100. And here you can see this, this really looks like histology. This looks like somebody took my wet and sliced it on a plate. You can see the coil vessels. You can see... Everything, really, in nice detail. And we'll see why this is important later. Okay, so what do we, what do, we do with this technology in our practice? I want to show you a whole bunch of clinical examples. Now, all these slides are taken from my practice. These are my patients. These are the things that I've seen in the last two years. And just tonight, I added a whole bunch of slides because one of my friends told me he's going to listen to this talk, and he's listening to one I gave about six months ago. So I thought, well, I better change the talk, otherwise he'll think I'm, I'm more, you know, I'm, I'm not capable of uh, any variety. So we're going to we get a whole bunch of stuff tonight. Okay, so here's our preoperative assessment. A patient with a mild epi with a membrane on examination. And he has a cataract. He wants a premium implant. Can you offer it? Well, what's really going on with the cool. So here's a patient's left eye. And, you know, she did have a little epi retina membrane here. And you can see that on the OCT, she has a very normal macular architecture. I did a crystal lens on her. She did great. She was very happy. No problem. Here's a guy in a little more complex situation. He's a 52-year-old. He presented me with a retina detachment. Here's the high watermark of the retina detachment going right up to the edge of the macula. This was fixed, and he did well, but he developed a cataract. And he was referred back to me for cataract surgery. He wanted a premium lens. 
if you look at the macro, you say, well, this doesn't look so great. But if you look at the architecture here, the macro architecture is pretty normal. We ended up doing a crystal lens on them, and we ended up 2020 and J2. and very, very happy with the outcome. Now, in contrast, this is a 65-year-old physician fly with moderate cataracts. She was asking about crystal lens. So I've done laser endotomies on her for now, and so her vision was 2025 to the right and 2040 to the left, and she had moderate cataracts, two plus cataracts with cortical strokes in both eyes. You know, I thought if she's a high profile, I thought it would be reasonable to offer something. Looking at the macular line eye, she has a mild epi retina membrane, but if you look here, she's got some cystic changes here. The epi retina membrane is pulled up here on the, uh, on the macula and caused some stasis changes here. And the other eye, even though the epi retina membrane looks very, very mild, she already has these uh, cystic changes and stasis cavities in the macula. And this is the exact kind of patient that's going to get into trouble when you do cataract surgery with uh, cystoid macular edema and vision that's not as good as she'd like. So I think we told her, let's, let's hold off until this gets significantly worse. I didn't want to be not able to deliver something she was expecting. Here's another example of this, a 63-year-old plus 6 hypro. She's uh, 2025 minus 10 in the right eye and a 2070 amblyope in the left eye. You know, he's got two cortical scopes, moderate and S. Uh, he has my hydro hypertension on Zalatan. And I performed sacral defect on his right side. And she was very happy with the outcome. And so he was saying, hey, can you fix my eyes? Well, I don't need glasses. And your health problem's worse than mine. Maybe you can fix my problem. They're very mild if you read the membrane on exam, mostly outside the full relay vascular zone. You look here, there's nothing bad impressive. But look at his macula. He's got pretty profound architectural changes here. And if you just go right above the foveal, you can see he's got this splitting, this stasis type change of the macula. And again, this is a one eye you know, essentially one of our patients, I said, you know what, let's, let's put this off until you really need it, rather than doing, you know, an early refract of uh, cataract surgery for you. Um, this is a 28-year-old referred by retina for cataract surgery. Uh, he was fast post buckle for macular off our days. He was 28, he was really dense post to subcapsular haze. You know, it's pretty hard to view the retina. Uh, retina guy scored his retina was fine. They said, he's time to do the cataract. And this is the scan I got through that pretty impressive PFT cataract. You can see it shows that he still has subretinal fluid here, and this is a great image because even though the view of the retina is not great, you can actually see the photoreceptors here hanging in the breeze because uh, of the subretinal fluid. We just decided to wait a little bit longer and let that resolve before we do the surgery. So, you know, we knew that we would get a good outcome for him, and that's what we did. He did just great. Now, this is a case that I really love. This is a 76 year old male referred by an optometrist for bilateral cataract surgery. Um, she had suggested crystal lens to him, knowing that that's the lens I use a lot. He was cow fingers in the right eye and 2100 in the left. He had no RAPD. His auto refraction was plus 7 in the right and plus 1 in the left. On the ILO medicine, it showed that he had a 21 millimeter right eye and a 23 millimeter left when he measured it. So I told the patient, you know, you probably never really saw well in the right eye, but he insisted otherwise. He said, you know, Larry, I saw fine up until about a year ago. Uh, he was an Irish man, and, uh, you know, he was very intelligent, and I just couldn't understand how a guy this sharp could miss the boat that he never really saw well in his right eye. So it's clear that he must have been amniotic with this big difference here. And he had moderate in the group for those. So 2040 range, I thought. He had asteroid hyalosis in the right eye, so my view was very poor in that eye. But when I looked at him, everything was essentially normal. And I recently got in the first trial for my practice, well, let's, let's see if we can see anything. And so when I scanned his right eye through the asteroid hyalosis of the cataract, this is what we saw. He had really profound vitreotop macular traction, elevating the macula. And this is why he was auto-effacting with plus 7. This is 2 millimeter elevation here. It's also why he uh, um, had uh, at, you know, the, the, the short eye reading on the um, uh, 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 on the master. So... Um, the other eye looks like this. He's got a lamella hole here. I referred him to retina. They took care of the, uh, they did a vitrectomy form, and then we ended up doing the cataract. He ended up doing pretty well. He ended up 2050 in this side and about 2040 in this side after cataract surgery. So he did quite well. Um, but if I, if I not had that scan, I would have probably denied him surgery, not knowing what was going on, or put the wrong power lens in if I did do the surgery. Um, this is a, Similar situation as an 82 year old woman. She's monocular. She's referred uh, on pilot carping uh, by another ophthalmologist. 
has glaucoma and cataract. Uh, it's good diabetes, pressure 24, she's a small tooth, but she's got a very dense cataract. Now, and uh, she's a first to take you know, fit cataract and glaucoma surgery. You know, uh, she's a one-eye patient, she needs both, and, um, you know, we, we, we do see fair number of this type of thing in my practice. Um, she's already had an iridotomy. The IFP is, uh, I, I did the iridotomy, actually, because I thought her angles now. Pressure went down to 16 with the iridotomy, but still no view of the retina. She doesn't dilate when, when I took off the pyro. I can't see the fundus, so, you know, what next? Well, even through the small pupil and dense cataract, we're able to get this excellent image of the macula. And what it shows is that she has a peripapillary uh, uh, subretinal net that's leaking fluid into the macula. You can see here the subretinal net, peripapillary uh, uh, subretinal net leaking fluid. Here's the fluid in the macula. And we sent her to the retina people there. She got, she got a few we sent this injections. They quieted this down. I did the uh, cataract. Um, and she did great. She ended up 2020. Um, the ability to over scan the same, uh, to track the retina, scan the same area over and over, gives you excellent follow up when you treat patients. Here's a patient who presented with diabetic macular edema, and I did a laser on her. And you can see a few months later, her response to treatment, this green area shows you how much the retina has lost 153 microns of thickness. And she went on to actually lose more. Um, over time. Here's an example of a patient where over time you can see the changes in the exact same spot. We start with this. She does develops a little macular edema, a little bit more. Here you can see the red showing the increase in thickness. I did a cataract surgery and injected her with Kenalog, and you can see that the red has thinned out a bit here. She's looking much better. Um, let's talk a bit about some of the post-operative issues that I see in my practice, and you probably would see in yours. Uh, patients had cataract surgery, and now there's a problem. Uh, the old paradigm is, uh, you know, reassure or refer. Um, now, with such domain OCT, we can really see what's going on at the level of the macula and what its contribution to the problem is. This is a 78-year-old male who comes in for a second opinion. He had cataract surgery two or three months ago elsewhere, and he has persistent poor vision he's unhappy with. In fact, 2070 with a minus one. He's still on Fort macula on the left eye. When I looked at him, the implant in the left eye was partially in the capsule bag and partially over the capsule bag. The anterior and posterior capsule were fused under the implant. So you had sort of the in and out syndrome with the radial tear down here. Now if you look here, you'll see you actually have a hole in the posterior capsule here. And this haptic on goniostopy was irritating the ciliary body. You can see here's the hole in the posterior capsule, the anterior and posterior capsule fused. And this is irritating the ciliary body. Here's his uh, OCP, and he's got massive cystoid macular edema. So I decided to reposition his implant. What I did was reopen his capsule bag. I put the lens back in the capsule bag. He still has a radial tear here, but he's got one half a here and one half a here, so the lens is firmly in the bag. And then we uh, yagged him, and you can see uh, his cystoid macular edema. This is the same guy, completely resolved a few months later. I also gave him a catalog injection at the time of the, cat, uh, of the eye well reposition. You can see the, um, some of the stuff in the catalog on the retina here. Oh, but he did very well. This is a great case. This is um, the head of the medical staff, a physician, uh, brought his dad into me because he had been told his dad had a dislocated lens and sent it to a retina guy, and the retina guy gave him my name. Um, you can see he's got pseudoxfoliation syndrome. His lens and bag have completely dislocated into uh, a sub set position. And the lens is a one piece team and lens in the bag. Here you can see the white little you know margin of the pupil is a pseudoxfoliation patient. You can see all the pseudoxfoliation material. So I decided to wax here this lens with uh, nino proline um, over here and over here uh, on the flaps and reposition the lens. And day one, here's what he looks like. He looks great. He's did great. He was very happy with this. He was finally twenty twenty until one year post op. Comes in just about a year post op and he's saying, you know, my vision's not as good as it was. And I have fracked him, he's only about 20, 30 minus. Yeah, he's in his 80s, so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, well, maybe it's just a bad day. You know, the photography's normal. I looked at his retina. His retina really didn't look, look remarkable. But I looked really closely. I thought I saw something, so I brought him to the OCT. And here's a scan right through his macula. You can see his choroid is elevated. And he's got some fluid here. When I move the scan line down, 
He's actually got, uh, if you look at one of the contact lenses, it looks like central serous retinopathy. When I went back and looked at the contact lens, yeah, it's sort of like you can see there's some elevation here. But you know, it's like with central serous, it's pretty easy to miss, especially in a patient that doesn't dilate well when you're looking with 78 dial the lens. So here you can see actually a colloidal elevation and blunting of the colloidal vessels and fluid here. This is metastatic lung adenocarcinoma, which we picked up on this examination with the OCT. And he was treated for that. And, you know, if I had missed that, you know, I don't think it would have been, I think all the good that I did repositioning his lens would have been lost uh, if I had missed that, uh, at least in the patient's son's mind. Uh, this is a 16-year-old piano teacher with third by an optometrist, and I, and I did a crystal lens on the left eye. This is right before I got my spectralis. Uh, I vision of 225 minus. That's as good as I get her. She's happy, but I'm not because she's not 2020. She wants the other eye down, but I'm nervous because I can't get her to see as well as I'd like. I looked at the macula and looks normal. We got the spectralis. I looked at the macula, and here you can see she's got a little mellow macula hole. Um, and these are incredibly common. I, I, you cannot believe how common these are in your practice. Here's her other eye we haven't done yet. It also has a lamella hole. And I said, you know, we can go ahead and do the other eye. I'll see 2025 also. If that's good enough for you, it's good enough for me. I told the optometrist, look, she's not going to see 2020 because she doesn't have a normal macula. And everybody was happy because everybody understood what was going on. The lamella holes are extremely common. There's only no clue on clinical exam. The macula looks essentially normal. They knocked the vision down about 20, 25, 20, 30 with a variable size microscopoma, and the patients are variably unhappy to unaware that they have a problem. Uh, here's another example of one of these. Um, very often they're associated with epiretina membrane. They actually pull this leaflet of the macula up a bit because of traction. Um, spectralis gives you a pre-surgical heads up on these and allows you to counsel patients on what their real expectations should be post-op. And then we can move forward with the appropriate lens. I think it's fine to do a crystal lens with torque or maybe spheric on one of these patients. I, I don't do multifocals on these because I don't think it's going to give them the vision they want. Uh, but it eliminates the post op and surprise and associated blame game when a patient doesn't get what they expect it. And then, you know, by giving them warning pre op, you know, of what they're going to get and they get it, it's sort of the patient focuses on the improvement rather than on what they're missing. So here's, a, and here's just another example of one of these. Um, you can see that here's the operculum. Here's the piece of the uh, macula that's been pulled out here. And um, the, that, that's another example of a lamella hole. Here's a 78-year-old woman's status post cataract surgery. A year ago, I did the surgery. Her vision's dropped in both eyes, but she feels the left side's really gone down. She's 20-20 minus 2 on the right, 20-80 on the left. Everything looks normal on examination, and the weather really is not impressive. Here's photographs of her macula. It looks pretty normal on the right. It looks pretty normal on the left. I might be a little yellow spot here. So here's her OCP image of the macula, and you see she's got this very thick, uh, very thick posterior hyaloid attached to the macula in the right eye. Look at the left eye, right through the macula. I, I call that the shark's mouth spine. It looks more like a shark's mouth, doesn't it? Um, and look at the, a movie of a scan going through this. She has a very thick poster of hyaloid, and it's attached to her macula and causing all this traction. I mean, it's hard to believe that this is the same patient that looks like this on examination. So this explains why she's 2080, and, uh, you know, the little camera sees things the this camera don't, and, of course, the OCP sees things that nothing can see except an OCP, and you can see why she's not seeing well. This traumatic attraction is another one of those things that's much more common than expected in your practice. And it's another cause of unexplained mild and mild vision loss before and after cataract surgery or any kind of natural segment surgery. And this is a precursor to a lamella hole. Here's a patient with third need for cataract surgery, again asking about restore. Um, he has a vitreal macular attraction on the right eye and vitreal macular attraction on the left. And if you pull this plug out, now you'll have a lamella hole. I did cataract surgery on him after he was seen by retina. They agreed, go ahead and do the cataract and we'll see how he does. And here's uh, before surgery and after surgery. You actually see that there's been a little reduction of the uh, vitreal macular attraction with cataract surgery. His uh, maximum thing pulled up 53 microns left. So he actually had a little improvement. He ended up 25 both eyes. Very happy because he was 2060 before surgery. And there's another example of a woman who I've done cataract surgery on. She drops 2060, her macula looks essentially normal, and here's the uh, vitreo macular attraction uh, with extensive posterior hyaloid. 
and she was treated with a mycoplasma injection. Um, here's a 68 year old wheelchair that had done crystallized in both eyes. She presented with a floater in the left eye. She's very happy with the surgery, but the non dominant left eye has a, a new PVD. The right eye is asymptomatic. I said, well, put on the OCT. We'll see if, you know, just make sure everything's okay, because she's a VIP. Um, and what we found that the right eye, the normal eye, the eye without the floater, just picked this up. She has a coronal nevus here under the macula associated with fluid. Uh, she has a subretinal nevus location associated with the nevus and fluid here. And she ended up being, uh, you know, this being picked up a lot of macular vision, and she was treated with the census. Um, these macular nevi, we've seen many, many of these in our practice. Uh, they, they can be amelonotic and difficult or impossible to see. They can really lead to a uh, separate nevus or vision or cold leakage that reduces vision. And it can be treated if picked up. And sometimes it's even an melanoma, not a nevus. Here's a patient. I did torque lenses in both eyes. Right eye 2020, he said, you know, my left eye is not quite as good as the right. Here's his left eye. He's got a sudden macular uh, nevus, and it may be a melanoma. We're not, we're not sure yet. He's saying that Jerry Shields has not told about this. Um, he's got this uh, uh, um, uh, SRN here, and he's got this fluid. Um, and this is picked up uh, with the OCT. I, I would not have seen this on examination. Um, this is an 82-year-old male monocular patient. He's had a main occlusion of the right eye. He's had cataract surgery by myself on the left. And the vision dropped from 20, 20, 20, 25 minor. No approval with refraction. He had mild macular degeneration on exam, but nothing that would stick out at you. I got the OCT just because he was a one eye patient. wanted to make sure everything was okay. And here you can see it's scanning right through the macula. Here's subway only of the information. You see this blood breaking right through. Leaking fluid into the macula. This is just a classic uh, subretinal vascularization. And you can pick these up beautifully with spectralis. Um, it, it's pretty impressive to see some of these in images. There's another example of this. This is 78 year old. I've done 30 on. I say, you know, my vision's great. I'm happy. But, you know, my grandson's pitching for the Atlanta Braves next month. Um, he does the 30s. He's a rookie. And I want to see him really clearly. Maybe he can give me glasses. I can see just a little bit better at distance. Uh, I couldn't have factor the left eye better than 20-30, and there wasn't much on exam. So we did an OCT, and you can see, even though the macula looks pretty normal, she's got this subretinal revascularization of fluid under the macula. And, I mean, I love this image because it's how crystal clear it is. You can practically count the photoreceptors. Uh, and she was, um, uh, again, treated with these centers and did very well. Here's another example of a subretinal revascularization breaking through. Um, and you can see the fluid, you can see everything laid out for you nicely. Uh, let's talk about some other diagnostic dilemmas. Ask the million dollar workup or before you initiate it. Here's a 55 year old woman I saw after the million dollar workup. She has top here. Prior to my seeing her, she'd been seen by retina and neuro ophthalmology with no definitive diagnosis. She actually had had negative temporal artery biopsy uh, because of her persistent symptoms. Uh, she's being considered a possible uh, acute zone outer uh, occult retinopathy, Azor. Um, when I scanned her on the spectralis, it showed that she had this very thick posterior hyaloid attached to the optic nerve. And this is an example of a virtual papillary traction syndrome. And this was causing her symptoms. It was right in the area that correlated with the uh, uh, being able to reproduce her symptoms. Uh, and uh, after showing this image to the ophthalmologist, he agreed. Uh, this is no doubt the cause of the problem. We've seen quite a few of these now. Here's a 41-year-old woman with the flashing lights, floaters, normal retina exam. Uh, she's very anxious. She has a fear of retina attachment. And here, let me just go back. Here's the image of her. You can see as we scan through the optic nerve, she has this vitreal capillary traction. We can isolate the uh, area right here. And we watched this for about a year. This pulled off and her symptoms went away. But we've seen patients now referred in for photopsy after cataract surgery where uh, intraocular lens exchange is being considered, and it wasn't from the lens. It was a positive dyscopy is coming from vitro capillary traction. Here's one more example of a 52-year-old with photopsia. She has a disc hemorrhage on exam and subtle decrease in vision. And if you look here, you can see a disc hemorrhage, and right through, we cut right through that disc hemorrhage, you see there's actually vitro capillary traction right in that area. And here's a scan from her optic nerve. You can see where the disc hemorrhage is right here. And when you hit that disc hemorrhage, that's exactly where the um, 
vitro papillary attractionist. And what I've learned with spectralis is that patients with acute PVD, this is a PVD of evolution, the patients with acute PVD actually can develop a little transient optic neuropathy where they can have subtle loss of vision. Even I've seen patients with mass on pupillary defect and a little disc swelling associated with this, as well as disc hemorrhages. Uh, the vision usually does come around there for a month or two, though. Um, here's a classic situation, a 69-year-old with sudden vision loss in the left eye. She has no abs, 27 year left eye, no APD, no pain, normal for left exam. You know, I, I, I did the OCT rather than, you know, just to cut right to the chase. We didn't dilate on our animal factor. I felt something was wrong with the macula because of the way she's reading the chart, she's missing the central letters. And here's the left eye. You know, this looks like a lamella hole, but she's fixating on the blue light when I asked her to look straight ahead. A little ectopically, because in the center, we can pull the line down and scan where I think the phobia is. She has a full thickness macular hole. And, uh, you know, we can take this line, drag it up, drag it down, scan wherever we want. Uh, so she's got a full thickness macular hole. I, I, the diagnosis was made about two minutes. I didn't have to waste a lot of time, you know, uh, banging my head against the wall and practicing her and this and that. You know, we, we knew exactly what was going on here. It saved a lot of time. Here's a 56-year-old shoulder society president. Uh, we, I've been treating him for dry eyes. Uh, he's got pretty bad macular generation, uh, being treated by the retina specialist. Um, he's complaining, because, you know, my right eye did great. I'm 20-25. But the left side, she's not doing that good. You know, my left side is just not as good as the right. He's referred back to me for ocular surface management because the retina people think it's probably related to the ocular surface and want to know what can be done. So I'm saying, you know, ocular surface looks pretty good. Here's his right macro, that's the 2025 eye. Here's the left side. He's actually got this fluid here under the macula because I believe it's related to this, the vitreomacular interface here. And you see this little white reflection here we often see when there's vitreomacular uh, interaction like this. And I had just in that an article earlier uh, that month, I read about the role of abnormal vitreomacular adhesion in age-related macular generation. SDOC cheap tomography and cervical adults and show that high rate adhesion to the macula is associated with AMB and frequently causes vitreomacular attraction of the CMV. Traction reports may antagonize the effect of anti vegetative treatment and cause pharmacological resistance in the subpopulation of patients. So I sent the patient back with a copy of this abstract and said, you know, you may want to consider giving them a mycoplasma injection due to the vitrectomy because I think that's why he's not responding well. And that's what they did. And, you know, be, he was very happy about this. Um, here's another example of an 85 year old male with first or second opinion, unhappy with the outcome of his premium lens surgery. He doesn't look back better than 2030. His reading vision is not what he would like, even with glasses. Cornea is normal, virtually no effect of lens error. The only thing I see is a tessellated fundus or a hybrid fundus, a very mild pigment granularity. And what he has is something called age related choroidal atrophy, and this is purely an OCT diagnosis. If you look here, look how paper thin this guy's choroid is. Normally the choroid is about the same thickness as the macro. Let's go back and find a more normal choroid. You know, that's a more normal choroid. It's about the same thickness as the macula, you know, like that. You know, but this guy's choroid is just paper thin. Now you see this in the high mild side very thin choroid, but this guy's not a high mild. And uh, this is from an article in May 2009, American Journal of Ophthalmology, from a guy, Rick Spade. Age-related cordial atrophy. He looked at patients who were not high myopes, and what they all had was uh, tessellated fundus, the tiger fundus, and mild macular pigment changes, which may look like very early age-related macular generation. The high association with glaucoma, the only patients have a very thin cord, averaging maybe 69 microns, and the vision just ain't that great. They're so about 20, 40 average. Um, and very often the reading vision is affected more than anything else. And I've seen a fair number of patients with third or second opinions who are unhappy with premium lenses. And really, uh, rather than doing a lens exchange or anything like that, uh, the problem I felt was related to this entity of age-related coil atrophy seen on OCT when I examined them. And, you know, we gave them their options that, you know, at least they understood what the problem was. Okay, so we've all... Uh, Taking the macro of the test, let's talk a little bit about what this machine does in terms of looking at the optic nerve, in terms of glaucoma and optic nerve evaluation. So this has been a very uh, useful addition uh, to my practice uh, as well. Uh, I feel like it's, yeah, you know, a little patient I've been treating for years, I finally had the answer at the back of the book. 
here's a, 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 some patients I want to show a little bit ducks flying up in the beginning here. Uh, you'll see what I mean. Here's a patient I spent glaucoma surgery on. She's a young Chinese woman in about 52, um, and she had, you know, very pressure-sensitive glaucoma, never higher than 22, in the mid-teens. She still had steel loss. If you look at this photograph, she's got a real block of nerve fiber that missing right here. And if you look carefully, you can really see this is just a wedge defect in the nerve fiber layer, and she's missing some rim here. And if we look at the HRT image here, you can see, yep, she's got this here, you know, progression over here all the time. She's got uh, abnormal more field analysis. Um, and, yep, if you look at the visual field, she's got loss of the superior rim. And let's look at the nerve fiber layer scan. This is what the circle scan looks like before analysis. You say, yep, there's this thin area over here. And now you analyze it and you say, yep, there it is. Here's our nerve fiber layer defect. And here's, here it is right there. She's missing a whole bunch of good stuff over here. She's got a big defect correlating with that. Here's the other eye. Again, she's got nerve fiber layer missing. Yep, this says there's been change down here. Uh, more fields now than normal. Here you go, she's got a wedge defect here, and here's a visual field defect. Everything lines up. Here's another example. Whoop. Where did I go? Okay. Here's a nerve fiber layer defect up here. Here's a nerve fiber layer defect down here. Here's a nerve fiber layer defect from that patient. Okay. And here's a visual field showing superior and inferior defects. Everything lines up great. So, what do you think of this patient? Nerves look pretty good, you know. This nerve clearly looks great. She's got a small cup here. But if you look careful, and you know, you get the spectrology, you start to look at the nerves a little bit better um, because you'll know what you're looking at. She's got a nerve fiber layer defect up here. If you compare this side to that side, you can see this has got more, longer carpet. The carpet isn't as fair as it is over here. And when you look at the visual field, you see she's lifting the fiber, she's drifting some field down below, associated with that nerve fiber layer defect. This is actually a woman I already gone glaucoma surgery on prior to getting the spectralis. So I was anxious to see if I had done surgery, this is the other eye, for the right reason. And here you can see she does have a nerve fiber layer defect correlating with this area up here we saw, I showed you earlier, this area here. Okay? On the spectralis, it picks that up. And it'll pick it up every time. Yeah, it does not miss these. Here's a patient with a disc hemorrhage. She was a glaucoma patient. We're following. Nerves don't look that bad. Here's a nerve fiber layer defect. If you look carefully, HRT picks up a little something change over here. Here's a nerve fiber layer, a visual field defect associated with that nerve fiber layer defect. That's new. And here it is on the spectralis. It's plain as day. I mean, you know, it just tells you right away what's going on. Well, if you've been fine, treating glaucoma for a while, you know that giant bits and tiny bits are traditionally very difficult to evaluate the glaucoma. You know, we uh, now know that uh, if a patient has a gigantic nerve, giant disc, they probably have a big cup. For example, if I tell you to make the biggest donut you can make with a pound of dough, it's going to have a big hole in it. So if you have a million nerve fibers and they collect into a giant nerve, it's going to have a big cup. So it's really kind of hard to know exactly what's going on. Here's a patient... You know, I was a friend of glaucoma. He's a Nigerian man. He's got giant cups. But if you look at his disc area, he's also got a very large out-of-range out disc area. You know, over three here and over four here. And it's the chalice images of the nerve fiber layer show that he's got absolutely wonderful nerve fiber layer numbers. I mean, this guy does not have glaucoma. He just has big discs and big cup syndrome. Here's a patient with a tiny little disc. Her cups are normal. She got a smaller cup on the left and the right, but I've been treating up the glaucoma because she got no fiber layer defect. I was aware of, and when I got my spectralis, I confirmed there it is. And here's a field. You can see the, the visual field defect here. So even with these tiny little 0.1, 0 0.2 discs that have glaucoma and no fiber layer defect and visual field defect, you weren't really sure about before. Now you can pick it up very, very easily. So spectralis is excellent for this. It's also excellent for detecting and quantifying optic neuropathy. Um, here's a patient that was referred to me for a second opinion for low tension glaucoma. That is a very interesting case. This is a young guy. He's a very intelligent guy. He uh, works for a pharmaceutical company as a researcher in biomedical uh, research. Very, very bright guy. He's in his 30s. 
And the kitchen team's vision has dropped significantly. He is really not feeling well. But the previous ophthalmologist for this cornea was very thin. He had a 470 cornea, and uh, he had a you know, slight pressure rate symmetry and cut rate symmetry diagnosed with low tension glaucoma. But I did my spectrologist and said, now, wait a minute. His vision's down. So, you know, that's not normal with a young guy with glaucoma. But look at this. If you look at the macular papilla bundle in each side, the macular papilla bundle has decreased nerve fiber layer. That's very weird. Glaucoma does not do that. Okay, glaucoma does this. Okay, here's a patient who's got end-stage glaucoma. You look here, the macular papilla bundle right here, that's professionally spared, okay? Um, if you look here, the macular papilla bundle tends to be professionally spared. They tend to lose from the superior, inferior, inferior pole, superior pole, and then they, uh, they don't lose central vision, you know, until the very last thing. This patient, she's got not a, I mean, a tiny little hole of field, a tiny little blip of field left. She's end stage glaucoma, but she's still 20, 30, and, you know, she's got no fiber layer of 45. She still has, um, you know, uh, preferential sparing. If you look here of the macula, papula lesion, okay? Where in the other eye, you can see also, but she's lost everything else. Whereas this guy, you look at everything diving down in the macular papilla region. I felt this was not the neuropathy, and we scanned them. It turned out he had white matter lesions all over the place, and we think this may be, he hasn't been conclusively diagnosed yet. Uh, we think he might either have, uh, um, you know, I, I don't want to go into too much, but he could have either MS or it's still labor's hereditary osteopathy. It's still an out of question because his vision loss is pretty profound. Um, here's another patient with the nine-inch cranial hypertension. She had disc swelling, the disc swelling resolved. Now you can see the optic neuropathy very clearly, the decrease in our five layer, and this correlates with the visual field. This is an astrophysicist who got hit with a racquetball. He's actually already lost vision of the other eye due to a racquetball injury. He's got cornea damage and wears a contact lens. He presented to me, preferred by an optometrist, um, he had um, phagodinesis. But his vision was down a bit, and he had a slight aspect uh, defect. And when I examined him, I thought I might have saw some disc swelling on exam. When I did the OCT, he clearly had disc swelling. Take a look at this. Hold on, let me see if I can get this to go. There we go. As he passed through the nerve, you can see this nerve fiber layer swelling. It's very impressive on exam. Now, this guy is a, a, a very intelligent guy. He's actually a famous astrophysicist, you know, researching, you know, black holes and stuff like that. So, you know, he was very, very able to understand what was going on here when I showed him this image of, these images. They're not something you would easily picked up on examination. It's something you think you see something, you get the scan, and you say, wow, look at that. And we've documented that this is actually getting better now all the time. One thing I do want to say, please do be aware that early compressive lesions and retrobulbar optic neuritis may present initially with absolutely normal OCT. So you still need to consider the visual field, aspirin defect, cultivation, and use clinical judgment. This is a, a doctor's wife who presented to me for a second opinion. Um, she had a slight decrease in vision in the right eye. Um, I thought she might have had an APD in the right eye. I couldn't have factored it good in the right or the left. I did visual field testing. The visual field was suggestive of a junctional scotoma. It was suggestive of a junctional scotoma. Now, the previous ophthalmologist had an OCT, not a spectrality, had an OCT. So the OCT is normal. We got nothing to worry about. So we never did a field on that. When I did the field, I thought it was suggestive of a junctional scotoma. Even though the OCT was normal, I, I referred up for an MRI. The MRI was normal, but I was still so sure that there was some wrong with that. I suggested that the MRI be redone and reviewed by a friend of mine who's a new ophthalmologist. It turned out that she did have a uh, brain tumor, uh, which has subsequently been treated. So, you know, my point is that the OCT can be normal with an early compressive lesion, early optic retrovolvo neuritis. Uh, if it just looks normal, but there's a deficit, you still have to use your clinical judgment. But, you know, when you're looking at the macula, this thing is like the answer book. When you're looking at glaucoma, this thing is pretty much like the answer book. It's going to teach you, uh, uh, yes, there's something there, no, there's not something there. It's going to make you a better clinician and a better doctor and really help you in your practice. I'd like to open it up to any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Saffron, for that excellent presentation. And Thank, we'll you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's go ahead and begin our formal question and answer session. If anyone has any questions, you can either send a private chat message or you can click the Q&A button at the top of your participant list. 
Okay. How has the spectral domain OCT changed your practice or improved your practice? Well, it's, it's changed my practice by allowing me to find out what's going on faster. I don't waste as much time guessing. So I, if the patient has decreased vision or is unhappy with the outcome of their surgery, I can, you know, you get an OCT uh, and, and know what's going on pretty quickly. And if the OCT is normal, I can focus on the ocular surface of the refraction. Um, it's helped me in terms of evaluating patients' opinion lenses. It's helped me for evaluating patients for second opinion. It's helped me for dealing with patients with just about everything you can think of. I mean, it's, I don't sell glasses. I have a pathology-based practice. But unless they're coming in with a lid problem, you know, this thing is pretty invaluable in terms of being absolutely sure that you know what's going on with the patient. Excellent. And do you routinely scan all of your preoperative cataract patients? Um, I scan all of the patients that I'm talking about premium lenses with. If, they don't, if, they're, if we're going to do premium lenses, I, I will scan them, and that's part of that federal premium lens uh, surcharge that they pay for. Now, if it turns out that they have pathology and we don't do a premium lens, then that's another issue. If I see somebody and they have an abnormal macula, it's clearly abnormal on exam, I might not offer them a premium lens because of that, and then we'll scan them for that reason. But we don't, we don't scan every single patient. Um, I scan them if the macula looks abnormal, and I scan them if they're going to have a premium lens. If the macula looks pristine and, you know, there's nothing funny going on and we're just in the standard lens, um, I, don't, I don't necessarily scan them. But I, I might. I might. It depends on the situation. We're moving more and more to scanning more and more of our patients. Because it's just easy to do the scan than it is to worry about what might be going on with the macula. It's very fast. It's very easy to do. You know, we don't charge for unless there's a reason to do the scan. And if we're doing a premium lens, it's bundled into, the, uh, into what they're paying for anyway. And just like we do with photography on every cataract we do, I do corneal photography on every single cataract I do because you don't know what, what's going on. You only have three diopters of corneal astigmatism and nothing in the refraction or vice versa. So you don't know what to do unless you have, you know, I don't think, I think you need photography. I think the two things you need for premium lens surgery is photography and uh, OCT so you know what's going on. There's no surprises. Excellent. And you had mentioned APD. Do you typically dilate your patients, or can you do this SDOCT without dilating? You can do this uh, from pretty much everybody without dilating. The thing gets right through. I mean, we have patients who don't dilate and they're pretty bad cataracts or uh, the corneas don't look good. And because of the overscanning, it'll actually build an image right in front of you. Like you look and it starts off at the two, three, four, five, six, seven scan and starts to see that image crisping up. It just throws away the junk and keeps the good stuff. And you'll see the image build in front of you. And it, I showed a couple of patients where, I mean, I couldn't see the retina hardly at all. This thing gave a scan. You would think it was like the clear media. It's very, very impressive. You know, I, I think this thing can get a better scan through, you know, a cataract that's hard to see through. And, you know, most other machines can get through a crystal clear media with the pupil dilated. So you don't have to dilate patients most of the time to get macular scans or optic nerve scans. Sometimes, you know, if they have PSC, sometimes you're better off just dilating them. It makes it easier for the pet to get the scan. Excellent. And how do you compare your time domain, as, as time domain OCT to your spectral domain OCT? Are they in comparison? Are they what? Are they? Can you, I didn't hear that. How, how do you compare the two? Well, I think that um, it's, it's really not a fair comparison because the spectral domain is so much better that uh, it's, it's really, uh, you know, you, you can't even begin to compare. It's like, you know, comparing, you know, uh, uh, you know, going to a top-notch resort to sleep in a, you know, jail cell, really. I mean, the, the time domain OCT is very slow. It's very burdensome for the patient to sit there for a while. It's hard for the text to work. And it's limited in terms of what it can do. Image quality is not that great. It's a bit like impression of stars. You know, you have to interpret the images. Here, there's no interpretation. The images are like histology. What you see is what you've got. You know, it's like literally looking at histology. The images are so clear. The image acquisition is very fast. You can get all these volume scans and grids. The less time that it takes to get one scan of the, you know, one little line scan. So we can get a tremendous amount of information and look at just about any part of the retina we want in tremendous detail uh, and do it very, very quickly. Uh, we know when we go back, we're going back to the same area. Where there's no artifact from reconstructing an image with moving artifacts. 
you know, it's it's just night and day, really. Uh, you know, once you start doing specs and main OCT, you, you know, they look at your time to main OCT. It's like comparing a, you know, it, it, it's like comparing a retina scope to a to, to an auto factor, and then the auto factor to a wavefront. I mean, not that retinoscopy doesn't have a space. I'm just saying there's a really a a a, a, a pattern shift in terms of uh, quality of what you can get. Another question. For glaucoma patients, are you switching to speckle domain OCT from HRT or GDX for optic disc assessment? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, because, um, you know, you can only do so much. Because we do visual field, we do chemistry, we do bonioscopy, we do, um, you know, uh, some photographs of the nerve, we examine the patient. And you got to do an imaging. We, we, we can't be doing everything. But we sometimes will do HRT and uh, OCT, uh, and just eat, you know, you can't, you can't both, both of them, obviously. Uh, but we do it because we want it on the record, on the chart. But we find more and more relying on uh, OCT because uh, there's a more robust platform. They can get through cataract, astigmatism, cornea abnormality. You know, the stuff that throws the HRT off just has no problem. It just lasts right through. And because of the tracking, you know, you're looking at the same thing. There's no issue with reference plane changing. Um, but it, you know, whatever you see, it, it, it sees things you can't see. So if it tells you something there, you're going to say, yeah, I'm shocked. I mean, there's something there I didn't see. You know, whereas, you know, with HRT, if it's all what you saw, you tend to agree with it. This, it's, it's these things you can't see, and it calls your attention to stuff that, you know, you just don't know it's there. But it's smarter than you are. And, you know, you, you find yourself saying, well, this is what I'll do, because, you know, it adds something. It doesn't, it doesn't, it, it really adds something useful clinically uh, that you would not have without it. So we find ourselves more and more relying on this uh, because of, of, of that capacity. Capability, and also because it can scan everybody, the cataract patients, the cornea patients, the funny corneas, the astigmatism patients, it doesn't care, it gets right through all that stuff. So, you know, the HRT can't do that. That's excellent. And another question. What is your experience, if any, with a patient with open angle glaucoma and concomitant empty cella syndrome? I, I really couldn't comment on that. Um, I, I think... Uh, that, that, that's not something I, that would really be my, uh, my area of expertise. I'm, 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 you know, uh, I'm I, I find out. I'm familiar off my yeah. practice, but, um, you know, I, I, if there's optic nerve damage, uh, this, this thing will pick it up. That's all I can tell you. I don't know how you differentiate, uh, where, what's causing the damage in a situation like that necessarily, but that, that'll be something more in the domain of a neuro ophthalmologist, which I'm not. And a final question. What cataract grade could be useful with the spectral domain OCT? What's your recommendation? Well, the cataract what? The grade. So I guess he's, I guess the question is... Uh, with well, I can tell you this. It can see through cataracts I can't. Uh, it sees better through cataracts than I do. Now, if you have a white cataract, you know, where nothing's getting through, nothing's getting through. Uh, we've been able to get through cataracts, wonderful images, to patients we can't get out, we cannot get out all master numbers through. Uh, I've been able to get wonderful images or useful images on patients. I mean, I'll give you an example. I had a patient that was referred to me for a cornea transplant and a lens exchange. She had, he had an ACI well and a cloudy cornea, and you know, I couldn't see a damn thing looking at the retina. Um, I put it in the oral 28 and couldn't see anything, and I was able to get enough of a scan of his macula to show that he had massive CMA. So I decided to exchange his lens and suture and post the chamber lens rather than keep the anterior chamber lens and just do a PK because I knew he had CMA. Um, the machine gave me that. I mean, I didn't see tremendous detail. At least I saw he had CMA, and I couldn't see anything, anything. Neither could the, you know, nobody could see anything with the macula. So it's, it's pretty impressive what you can get through. Obviously, if the thing's a you know, brick wall, you're not going to get anything through it. Laser can't get through it. But you can see things in cataracts you can see, you cannot see through. I can tell you that much. But I'd say get through a dense NS cataract, get through a PSC if uh, it's not, you know, complete PSC, um, and, you know, you'll get useful information on most of your patients. All right, and a final question. Is there any differential signs to distinguish between choroidal nevus and a small choroidal melanoma? 
You know, there are, but that's more, uh, uh, I think, clinical stuff. I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in evaluating OCT in terms of how to differentiate melanoma from nevus. I mean, you know, Jerry Shields, they have their, uh, you know, mnemonic, you know, two fine small melanoma where they talk about distance from the optic nerve and subretinal fluid and orange pigment and all those things. Um, G presence of Jews and, uh, yeah. I, I don't want to go into that. It's not really the scope of this. Um, what I can tell you is that if you look at a nevus, uh, you'll know it's a nevus because it obliterates the chordal vessel. You'll see marbleization. Whereas when you used to see chordal vessels, you'll see marbleization instead. And if there is subretinal fluid, that is associated more with melanoma than nevus. But when I see these, you know, we take them out. Jerry Shields is 40 minutes away, so, you know, we send them to Jerry Shields. Uh, you know, he, he, he evaluates from the treatment. So that's, again, I'm, I'm a cornea surgeon. You know, I do a lot of glaucoma surgery, lid work, cornea work. But I'm not, I'm not, you know, enjoying the census and I'm not treating melanoma. You know, back to the question of, uh, you know, this possible melanoma, you know, they can go half hour away and 40 minutes away and see Jerry Shields and he'll, you know, make the call on that. So while there may be some signs, uh, that, that would be more specific, uh, maybe when Jerry Shields gets into the trial of folks, I'll give a lecture on that. I think he has one, actually, by now. All right. Well, again, I'd like to thank you so much, Dr. Saffron, for that excellent presentation this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking me to do this. Of course. And with that, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for taking time out of your busy day to join us. This course was recorded and should be available to view at your leisure within the next week. And with that, I'm Eva Kroniker. On behalf of all of us here at Heidelberg Engineering, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Saffron. And for those of you on the East Coast and in the Midwest, have a wonderful evening. And to those of you on the West Coast, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And to all of you, thank you again for joining the Heidelberg Engineering Academy.